We're ready to start. Oh, okay. We're ready to start. So welcome to our fourth live event of the GMO MOOC um, in week two. We've already done an animal scientist in a live uh, chat room, a uh, weed scientist, a farmer journalist pair. Um, and the recordings of these are all on the edX uh, course pages. So if you want to check those out, you can. This week, we're thrilled to be hosting uh, Neil Patterson, Jr., to my left, um, the assistant director of the Center for Native Peoples, and the environment, the State University of New York um, College of Environment, Environmental Science, and Forestry. It's about 50 miles northeast of where we're located in Ithaca. Thank you for driving down. Um, the scientists at SUNY ESF, uh, where Neil is associated, um, have developed a, a cure for a fungal blight that has virtually eradicated one of the keystone trees in the American Eastern Forest. Uh, and they've done this through genetic engineering. Um, there is a TED talk by William Powell that I hope you've had a chance to see, but if you haven't, it's really worth seeing both the restoration project and the different alternatives to genetic engineering. And this is week two, so we'll be talking about the broader landscape and not just the science and the technology. Now, um, my own involvement with chestnuts is, is pretty minimal, except that like, I work in India, as many of you know, who've worked, uh, who've looked at the uh, week two videos. Um, but I did take part in the crowdsourcing of Bill Powell's effort to get this off the ground. We were given um, chestnut seeds that we were supposed to plant and grow up. But like many biological uh, situations, my seeds failed. There seems to have been critters out there that were more interested in the seeds uh, than the seeds could tolerate. So I don't have any contribution other than cold, hard cash. Um, now, one particularly <clears throat> interesting element of this situation with the tree is that there's a lot of media coverage, but that media coverage doesn't mention much that ESF is, uh, is part of the Onondaga Nation's territory, very close to the Onondaga Nation's territory. And we wonder whether or not there is any kind of, of cultural tension in what your center might be doing to look at the larger landscape and negotiate questions of forest restoration and genetic engineering, cultural heritage, and issues of that type. So welcome, Neil. And can you tell us a bit about what work you do and, and your position there? Sure. Thanks, Ron. Um, well, the, the primary mission of the center where I work is really to uh, weave traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous wisdom, there's lots of terms for this concept, with uh, Western science or scientific ecological knowledge. Uh, and so we, over the last few years since the center was created, have been introduced to courses uh, and seminars and, and campus-wide events to bring, uh, bring light to TEK or traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I teach a seminar in TEK um, this semester and, and have been for the last couple of years. Um, but we also work very closely with our indigenous partners, um, uh, the Haudenosaunee, uh, of which all campuses in New York State actually sit on some uh, um, Aboriginal territory of these six nations. So the, the Haudenosaunee people are um, comprised of six different nations, Onondaga, as Ron mentioned, being the central fire of the Confederacy. And last year, we, uh, the center led a campaign um, called Where We Stand um, that will, that has sort of memorialized not only the proximity of the nation to the college, but the very fact that the nation has an active land rights or in what are often called land claims for the entire city of Syracuse um, and several campuses that SUNY ESF owns in upstate New York. Uh, and I would also mention that where we sit today and where we stand today on the Cornell campus certainly is also part of an existing land rights action by the Cuga Nation. Uh, so even the ground in which we're, you know, which you attempted to get some chestnuts going actually is the territory of the Cuga Nation itself. Uh, and so that's a very important um, fact and, and legal reality is that uh, Indigenous people have these uh, ties to the land um, that are pretty, 
um, not always uh, obvious to to settlers um, uh, in this part of the world. So um, another important aspect of our work is certainly our education and outreach component where we work with youth in the Onondaga Nation community. Uh, and we are just finishing up a, a very ambitious effort called uh, Helping Forest Walk um, to think about the role of Indigenous knowledge and um, as the climate begins to change um, and how Indigenous knowledge could sort of add to some answers potentially uh, regarding sustainability going forward under this uh, uh, in, in an era which some people are calling the Anthropocene. Um, so that's the work of the center and um, happy to share a little bit more um, as things move forward, I guess. Sure, not everybody would be familiar with the notion of traditional environmental knowledge or ecological knowledge. Could you tell us a little bit about what exactly that means and you're interested in its relation to science. So what's the difference between knowledge and science and where do we start with TE? Sure, so uh, you know, for millennia, indigenous people have had a very uh, different um, a yet intimate relationship with the landscape, with um, what we would call the biophysical reality um, of, in, in this case, of uh, the northern forest in, in upstate New York uh, for Haudenosaunee people. And, and so there are many practices, um, there are many beliefs, uh, and there is a lot of wisdom about um, relationships between humans and what we would call our relatives in the natural world. Um, which is the first distinction, right, that is a little bit different from Western science is that in many cases, Western science and scientific ecological knowledge is really about um, resources that have to be managed. Um, and so that's, I think, the first and primary uh, difference between TEK and SEK is the worldview itself. We, we have our stories about creation um, and, and how humans came to be where they are. Uh, and that really guides our practices um, on the landscape. So I've always said traditional ecological knowledge is participatory. Uh, it's it's based on observation, millennia, you know, thousands of years of observation of our relatives in the natural world. Um, but it also you take that a step further and engage. Them. That's a, a, a big piece of the um, puzzle that's sort of missing today is. Um, to our relationship with these relatives um, and that that's what we're really trying to restore. Thank you so much. Now for your for our listeners and learners out there we want to introduce Chris who will tell you a few things about Shindig so that you can operate through this platform. Chris? Hi Neil Ron, thank you uh, for introducing me. And so as we're going through all this great content and insight, I mean, as your questions are being answered, I wanna make sure you guys are fully aware of how to engage with um, Neil today. So on the bottom right of your screen, there is a raise hand button. By clicking that button, you'll signify that you'd like to come up on stage and ask a question or continue the discussion. So please don't be shy, feel free to do that. Additionally, there's an ask question button. By click clicking that button, you can submit a text question. Uh, that question will be accredited to you and published, and hopefully we'll get to all of the questions today, as I'm sure there's going to be a lot to cover a lot of different topics and information. Uh, additionally, if you'd like to interact with some of the other attendees, simply click on them and form into pairs or groups of up to five, and you can do small groups. And also, I want to bring your attention to the links we have on the far right. There's a student survey. Um, anyone that's enrolled in this class, we really appreciate that you took the time to fill out that survey about um, your experience in past MOOC sessions as well as this one. Um, and then there's also the social media channel links and the edX Cornell uh, GMO MOOC link as well. So take advantage of using those. Thanks for having me up here. Let's continue the great conversation. Thank you. Okay. And are there questions yet? Um, I haven't seen any coming up so far. So perhaps we could um, begin by a few questions from here. I, um, in this notion of traditional ecological knowledge, what happens when biology changes fundamentally? I mean, I'm curious, like the, the chestnut blight uh, it's from China, it's fungal, uh, it's an invasion like people like me, I come from Texas, so I'm, I'm an invader like the chestnut blight. But how does traditional ecological knowledge that has a, a knowledge of a system in its equilibrium or its equipose or its interrelated parts, 
how does that interact when the systems are fundamentally challenged or changed? The desk nuts are essentially gone. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it, essentially, it, it's a, a pretty significant change, both in terms of uh, the biophysical world itself. Uh, and so one of the things that has happened uh, in many indigenous communities is to uh, restore our traditional diets, uh, because what we're actually seeing are high rates of disease and other epidemics in our communities because our diets uh, have changed so drastically um, in the last couple of hundred years. Um, and so on a purely physical level, you know, Haudenosaunee people not consuming chestnuts presents a potential threat to, to the health of the, of the individuals themselves and communities. Um, and then, you know, it, and then the list goes on in terms of the biophysical impacts um, from changes in the landscape. You know, we, we have uh, a major, as you point out, a keystone species that's missing from our forests. Um, and so we have all the resulting impacts, uh, the ripple effect from that, where, you know, chestnuts were also a very significant food for, for our four-legged um, relatives in the woods and our, and our wing relatives in the air. Um, and you could probably say, you know, that there's probably not one thing that was not touched by chestnut in some way um, before the blight came to, to, the, to North America, to Turtle Island. Um, and then purely on a, on a cultural level, um, you know, I spent the last 20 years of my life relearning and, and learning Tuscarora language. That is where I come from, um, is from the Tuscarora Nation, one of the nations of the Haudenosaunee people. And uh, I actually don't even know the word for chestnut anymore. Um, and there are certainly practices in our culture about using chestnut, um, both for food, for fire, and for material, building material itself. And so uh, these practices end up um, uh, becoming, you know, in decline. Uh, you have a whole generation now, several generations who have not consumed chestnuts, uh, are not familiar with the tree, and have not worked physically with the tree um, as a gift to the people. Um, and so that's uh, what we talk about when we talk about biocultural restoration. It's really restoring the biophysical basis, um, and the cultural relationships that indigenous people have together as one concept. Um, and that's a little bit different from, you know, approaches with scientific ecological knowledge. I see. So, so the, the restoration effort has sort of three branches, as I understand it. One is to look for mutant chestnuts that don't have the blight. We have, we have several in our natural area here, the, the Ithaca City Natural Areas Commission. Uh, we know where several are, but we don't tell anybody. Uh, but their their offspring don't breed, um, but don't breed true. Um, then we have uh, a transgenic approach, which is being used at uh, Syracuse University. And then we have the uh, sexual crossing between the Chinese chestnut. So I'm curious, how would one evaluate these kinds of approaches? None of these would be considered traditional, I suppose. Uh, but if, is there a traditional way to approach this, or do any of these approaches seem more in tune with cultural practices and, and cultural values than the other ones? Well, that's a great question because at the very heart of who the Haudenosaunee people are, like many indigenous cultures, uh, we are farmers. Uh, and so for thousands of years, Haudenosaunee people have been selecting traits, especially with our, our three sisters, our corn and our beans and our squash. Uh, and so today with, there's a real, um, uh, serious effort to preserve those heirloom uh, open pollinated varieties of corn, for instance, um, and to protect the corn actually against, uh, you know, uh, cross pollination with the genetically modified uh, varieties, um, which requires on a very physical level, you know, some separation by at least a mile or more to, to preserve that genetic integrity. Uh, so coming from a, a culture that actually has uh, a wide spectrum of ways in which to modify plants and to actually change the relationship we have with plants. That's one of the first things that happens as indigenous people is we, some plants are uh, moldable. Some plants uh, give themselves to us um, and, and we work with them. We develop um, new strains of those plants for certain traits. Um, and so it's not that unlike this spectrum of you know, genetically modified chestnuts. Um, the, the spectrum is wide. And I think one of the um, efforts that is going on now at ESF is to work within Haudenosaunee communities 
to understand culturally appropriate ways to 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 modify our plant relatives uh, which hopefully will come out very soon in terms of having a, uh, a, a Haudenosaunee genetically modified policy of some kind. Um, many other Indian nations across uh, North America are beginning to establish these policies on their territories and uh, you know most of them are not um, too keen on, on on transgenic approaches on very fast breeding technologies um, that are using technology and science um, at, at a un unprecedented rate in terms of change so um, I think the jury is still a little bit out in terms of you know what makes sense but certainly from 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 an agronomist point of view you know we have been using slow breeding techniques since plants have been around and so one of the major um, pieces of you know advice that we get um, both as young people growing up in the community and still uh, recited today by our leadership is the precautionary principle um, of do no harm uh, and so we keep that in the back of our minds we keep those future generations who are potentially going to be surrounded by these transgenic chestnuts if um, if uh, the science um, holds true and and regulators are uh, willing to um, see this introduced to the landscape. Um, and so we, we keep that in our minds um, at all times. So I, I understand about maize, but the similar kinds of opinions are widely held in Oaxaca and there's a lot of con conservation of, of, um, uh, sort of indigenous varieties. I'm curious, um, so would a sexually modified um, chestnut that would that used traditional breeding, um, which would take probably 30 or 40 years to come up with a chestnut that would work. Uh, would that be more culturally appropriate? Uh, the, the Chinese chestnut is the one that's used for the crossing, which is not exactly in the Haudenosaunee universe, right? right. So I'm just curious, uh, between transgenic and sexually crossing and looking for mutations, what would you think? Um, <clears throat> I think it's more likely that that's uh, that slow breeding process um, to develop a resistant strain of chestnut is um, it, it would be more culturally appropriate. However, uh, that's the interesting thing about traditional ecological knowledge, right? Is this word tradition, uh, and people often think that that is stuck in the past. That that uh, that at some point, sort of the pre-contact tradition itself is a reference point for for restoration, but. Yet we've seen indigenous people all over the place um, adapting new technologies as part of their tradition. Uh, and so this becomes very important when we look at the number of mouths to feed on Mother Earth um, and the potential <clears throat> for uh, GM organisms to, to be part of the solution. Um, okay, so uh, we have a question from the audience. I think this is a, taking off on an interesting um, trajectory. How do we get to the person in the audience? Oh, the person doesn't speak. We have to read it. Huh? Okay. It says, integration, um, how do you manage to use science knowledge with traditional knowledge? Over here in Bolivia, traditional knowledge is held as superior. You see, from Cecilia. Uh, good question, Cecilia. Um, I, I think uh, the way that I've been taught and raised uh, in, in at, at Tuscarora at, is not looking at necessarily anyone as superior, but that they're complementary. Uh, and so we have um, lots of efforts in our community that are geared at, uh, for instance, uh, remediation of contaminants. Um, and so these new technologies uh, during the industrial age really uh, resulted in some serious, long standing and uh, persistent contamination to to our relatives in the natural world to the soil to 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 our waterways especially uh, and we need science to help remediate that uh, and that's where you know traditional ecological knowledge kind of uh, really accelerates is after that remedial process what is the restoration process and restoring our relationships with those relatives after uh, we, we engage in, in Get to a point where people can actually drink the water and eat the fish. Um, that's how I see Western science uh, really being braided alongside and within um, uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Okay, 
Um, do you have any sense, Neil, of um, whether or not there is a feeling in your community that the scientists at ESF are either not fully informing them or are not on their side or taking off on the wrong tack, or that there's a lot of feeling that we can work with, as you just said, uh, technological advances to restore traditional values and, and traditional ecological systems? Well, I, you know, I don't, I, I think pe people in our communities are so busy um, with many diverse issues um, and when it comes to the science of them what we end up thinking about a lot about and focusing on is uh, the, the federal government and, um, and their responsibility to indigenous people in, in the state so purely from a regulatory standpoint you know um, this is where treaties come into um, into the picture uh, we have a very specific set of treaties beginning with the two world wampum that talks about our system of governance and beliefs and practices being in a canoe and the system of governments for, for, for America being in the ship and that we would travel this river together, um, but that neither one would try to control or steer each other's vessel. Right. Uh, it's called this river of life. And so that sort of is the starting point for our relationship with scientists at a state university, in fact. Um, it's uh, it, it go, it's uh, goes a ways back, you know. It's a very historical relationship, but it's living today uh, in the minds of our leadership and our chiefs and our clan mothers. Um, and so, you know, that is probably a maybe more fundamental issue: is scientists can only go so far. Um, it's really the regulators then that uh, have this responsibility and this obligation and written clear as day in treaties uh, to consult with indigenous people about reintroductions or about introductions, about changes to um, the biophysical world that affect our culture. Uh, and that is really the, the subject of the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, to reinforce that and, and make sure that uh, the government's holding up their end of the, end of the bargain. Since you mentioned the treaties, uh, trust in government has never been lower in this country. And given the experience of, of indigenous peoples with these treaties, um, would there be much trust in federal regulators? Uh, we're, finding, we're finding a lot of distrust about federal regulations of virtually everything. Um, the, the recent uh, bill on biotechnology was called the Monsanto Protection Act, and people were angry with Obama about this particular act that shot down the Vermont GMO free legislation. Mm -hmm. And so would people from your nation trust the regulators either to make good regulations or to regulate fairly or efficiently? It's true. And, and in fact, the, the wampum beads that are woven into this two row wampum belt actually have a specific row of beads that represents trust. Um, and mm -hmm. so one of the, you know, again, fundamental teachings of that treaty is that we're not about to have the United States try to control our canoe or try to steer our canoe, but that is also reciprocal, that the Haudenosaunee government uh, is not about trying to convince U.S. state and local governments to do the right thing. Uh, we just expect that they make their decisions independently. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a curious position the Haudenosaunee hold across Turtle Island, in fact, is that uh, we do not lobby um, we, we don't believe in lobbying politicians to try to do the right thing because that would be as if we were jumping into their ship. Um, and, and so, you know, that mutual respect um, is also another role of the beads in that two-row wampum. And, um, and so, you know, we always have to trust. It, it's fundamental. It's, it's part of that uh, protocol that we have that we will trust that government regulators uh, will do the, do the right thing. Yeah, I, I have seen the representation of, of this single river in Washington, D.C. at the uh, National Museum of Indigenous Peoples. It's, 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 a, it's a really, but it's a it's really tragic history. So I'm, <laughs> I think it's a remarkable that you don't lobby. Um, so uh, if we could go on one more step, I'm interested in the um, traditional ecological knowledge about forests. So we know that there are 
many more of certain kind of critters in the forest in uh, Ithaca were plagued by deer, uh, and that's because we've lost wolves and so on. I'm curious how you think about the restoration of chestnuts in particular, if that's a, a, a culturally significant part. It's a keystone series, that's a biological species, it's a biological factor. But is there any cultural significance of chestnuts compared to, let's say, birch trees or hemlocks or anything else? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have several um, what people would call legends, but certainly in our history, we have uh, chestnuts mentioned quite often in, in Haudenosaunee myths and, and legends and stories um, going back to creation, in fact. Um, uh, and they, um, like two other very significant nut trees, are the subject of this great loss from an invasive um, disease. Uh, the other ones being beech nut itself uh, from beech bark disease, and the other one is um, butternut uh, from the butternut canker. Uh, and from a TEK perspective, you know, Haudenosaunee people have been tending the wild, is a term that Kat Anderson uses in, in, with California indigenous populations for forever. Uh, so our relationship with plants is one of both of reciprocity, that we're always thinking about what to give back to those forests. Um, as one as what the forests are giving to us. And so, um, you know, we've gotten a, a lot of evidence recently from science that shows how much Haudenosaunee people were actually moving forests across New York State and across our territories by deliberately assisting in the migration of certain tree species. Uh, and that's certainly true for butternut, um, certainly true for black walnut, who exists up in this part of the country you know, much more north of their, you know, original sort of range. Right, um, right, right. And, and, you know, it's quite possible chestnut as well. Um, we see, um, you know, at one time, a great dependence on chestnut from, from bears in particular. Uh, and bears are one of our nine clans. Um, and probably every one of the nine clans has some kind of relationship to chestnut. So myself being bear clan, you know, that's significant. That's part of that uh, relationship that has been lost now, um, just as you mentioned, wolves and deer uh, in this part of the state. So, um, you know, it's it's a living history. We have these legends, we have these stories about how things were created on the back of this giant turtle, and and that's um, that's going on today. We see it, it. You know, it's not just a chapter in the past. So, if one could reintroduce the eastern cougar, would that be important or? I, I mean, I, I take your point about the forest here. I mean, there's the emerald ash borer as well. There's the woolly adelgid. These things seem to be moving north with climate change. Uh, so that, how do you think about those challenges? Would restoration of a species has been made extinct? Would that be um, uh, something that you could support or something that it's too much, too much intervention with the system? I uh, know, absolutely. And, and for the last decade or more, the a uh, group that I work with, the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, has, has come out on record actually um, stating that we need to restore the gray wolf um, to New York State. Um, you know, and, and that's also because that's one of our clans. And so there are cases now in our culture, in particular with the wolf and the eel, um, that are one of our clans where our clan members have no longer seen and or had any kind of relationship with that animal anymore um, mm -hmm. for, for for eel in the last 50 years because of uh, hydroelectric dams and uh, for wolf from from over hunting and, and extinction uh, well over 100 years ago. Um, so absolutely, we need to think about restoration in those broader terms and that humans are part of the environment. Humans cannot be removed from the environment and uh, that's a famous saying from an Onondaga chief. He said, that, you know, we are not environmentalists. We, we are the environment. Uh -huh. so. what, what about coyotes? And, and you didn't answer about the, the cougar, the eastern cougar. It's disputed yeah. whether or not uh, there's a genetic difference between the eastern and western cougars. But is that a part of the, the panoply? Is there a clan for cougars? And what do you do with coyotes who are kind of taking over a niche a little bit below what a wolf would have had? It's true. So there's these large scale changes, um, you know, in in populations, um, but that's a little bit uh, about, you know, speaking to the difference from TEK versus SEK. Mm -hmm. SEK tends to be very sort of reductionist in, in, in some 
respects. Uh, and even for the gray wolf itself, um, thinking about this sort of subspecies population and sort of just giving up hope because, well, that subspecies is no longer here, so there's no point in trying to restore it. Um, you know, losing the genetic, you know, uh, foundation for a certain subspecies is uh, is is a tough thing to grapple with. Um, and I and I view cougar as you know being part of um, uh, a common sense approach to restoration, um, mm -hmm. where you see the role of predators, especially. Um, reintroduced, as we see in Yellowstone Park, you actually see very discrete changes to plant communities. Uh, when you when you introduce these predators, who then are controlling the number of uh, grazers uh, who, are, who are feeding on vegetation, you see the forest respond, um, and we would say it responds with gratitude. Um, you know that uh, many of the medicinal plants we have growing in the understory of what was once chestnut forests uh, don't have a chance because of the deer densities. Uh, and so I think cougar, wolves, I mean, they're all part of that, um, that restoration effort. They have to be. Do you take a major role in trying to eliminate invasive species? I mean, here in Ithaca, um, we're losing some of our most valuable indigenous plants because of the deer, as you mentioned. So in our natural areas, they're less and less natural. But politically, it's very difficult to shoot the deer because a natural area should be natural and deer are part of nature. How do, you, how do you walk that fine line between destructive parts of nature and the role that, that um, these animals have played in a, a healthier ecology? Uh, you walk that line very slowly. Um, and, and I see that in our communities, uh, not everybody is jumping on the bandwagon to go pull invasive plants from, from their backyard or from their forest communities. Um, they've only been here uh, in some cases for 10, up, up maybe 50 years, some well over 100. Um, but our teachings tell us about, you know, the, the gifts of plants and their responsibilities. And so many people are uh, under the impression or really fully believe that these plants came here for a reason uh, and that it's really not up to us as you know managers of the natural resource to decide who stays and who, who goes. Um, and in fact, maybe one day we will see uh, very significant uses and, and a role for plants like Phragmites, um, which is an introduced species to this area, which also happens to be a very efficient uh, filter. Um, right. Uh, and so, you know, garlic mustard, uh, water chestnut, all kinds of terrestrial and aquatic plants. Um, we are not so eager to, you know, spend our time and energy trying to eliminate every last one. You can have all of my garlic mustard. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it at all. Well, it makes a mean pesto. Um, uh, it, I've heard that. Yeah, I've, it's, I've it's never, not I've, too bad. Yeah. I've never tried that. Yeah. So, I, you know, when, when, um, when we did a sort of a, um, map of the web to ask about how people feel about genetic engineering, one of the big things that comes up is um, whether things are natural or not natural. And one of the most fundamental objections to GMOs is that they are in some way unnatural, but of course every person has a somewhat different vision of what is natural and unnatural. As you just mentioned, nature is continually changing. I mean, I have invasive species all over the land that I have and I, I'm constantly chopping out buckthorns and Norway mm. maples and things like that that don't have a good function in the environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious um, if, if you ask people in your community whether genetic engineering as a technique for remediating nature, or you mentioned, uh, I would mention biofortification, you're worried about diet, but mm -hmm. eco remediation. And people said, well, wait, this is unnatural. It is moving genes around inside plants or animals. Would there be that kind of unnatural or people say, well, the times have changed, our techniques have changed, we have more knowledge now, so we can accept these uh, as long as we do it, as you said, walking slowly. How would people feel about that? Well, I, I want to introduce the concept at this point, um, you know, of how significant language is, because language itself is uh, often descriptive of, of our relationship to our relatives in, in the forest world. Um, and so one of the first questions we are starting to ask is really, how do you say genetically modified in the Haudenosaunee 
language yes, yes. in the Iroquois language group because uh, there are words that we have for seed uh, and for life um, for flower uh, for all of these you know sometimes you know very discrete parts of plant life itself um, nut itself um, and so that I think has uh, is a process that's going to take time it's going to require some careful thought by people who speak the language who are fluent mm -hmm. um, to really tell us to help us guide are thinking on what's whether something is natural or not uh, and that hasn't happened yet um, because our languages are so endangered and we have so few fluent speakers and in, in right. my own language Tuscarora um, we have uh, one man left uh, essentially who, who, who can speak the language he's about 85 years old and uh, we plan on trying to work with him to identify what what these terms mean uh, and so it's it's a you know curious position to go into the world of science and technology and environmental restoration and say we need to be fluent in our language um, and so language restoration is part of that cultural restoration that that we're hoping will we'll, you know complete the picture with a purely biocultural focus Let's see uh, I, i'm new to this shindig business and neil i've, I've ignored three questions and the question is, can we read our three questions? Um, okay. <laughs> Neil, this is from Juliana on Facebook. Is there some form of resistance from indigenous peoples in sharing knowledge and accepting changes about the American chestnut program? So the, um, I, I think the challenge, um, and, and let me just say the short answer is, is yes. Um, and, and purely from a, from a moral sort of perspective about this this transgenic uh, inserting genes from one organism into another, um, and so on a very sort of uh, you know on a very moral basis, there are plenty of indigenous people across Haudenosaunee Confederacy who who do not agree with the concept at, at all, um, and a lot of that comes from you know looking at stopping GM trees, especially uh, in Central and, and South Africa, uh, where GM trees essentially are, are being used for profit um, and, and to produce, you know, lumber or, or materials. Um, and But yet the American Chestnut Restoration Project at ESF is so different in that it is really about restoring forest communities uh, and restoring our uh, relatives in, in the tree world. Um, uh, there is always a natural fear that maybe there's something else going on behind the scenes that maybe you know lumber companies are helping to guide this and you know through the American Chestnut Foundation that there's some ulterior motive to restoring chestnut which is a very valuable um, and hardy and rot resistant wood. Um, but at this point it seems that Dr. Powell and, and his colleagues are really interested in just replacing um, chestnut to the rest of the family. We have out there, and Dr. Powell says it will take a hundred years at least. So it's it's a very long process. Now, to to get a question up, I click on the person that's lit up. Is that how I do that? Hmm? Oh, Chris will put them up. Good. Next question, Chris. Oops. It says, "How does TEK get?" valued in regulations and policy, do you think academics are the only organizational entity acknowledging TEK? It's an interesting one. It is, and uh, no, the answer is that their regulators are paying close attention to TEK, in particular uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, at least in, in the United States, um, all have policies about uh, uh, utilizing or engaging or um, supporting efforts to restore traditional ecological knowledge. Um, you know, in, a, in a, one of the simplest ways, again, goes back to our language. Uh, we have names for plants in our forests that actually talk about relationships that science hasn't even discovered yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I commonly use the example of a, of a common plant around here called um, Bolt Salmon Seal. Our name for that is Gitnoxa Wahyaks. It's Gitnoxa Wahyaks means the red fox eats its berries. Uh, and so as I went to school for, for natural resource management, I uh, 
Uh, I surely somebody has studied this relationship between this animal and this plant, and and there is not one scientific study that that links those two organisms um, or, or talks about the relationship in in the literature. Uh, and yet Tuscarora people were saying this word for thousands of years. They had observed that. They know the red fox has a relationship with that plant. And as natural resource managers and other, other regulators look at, you know, restoring the environment, and that, you know, makes common sense. It just, it's the right thing to do to, to think about indigenous knowledge and what my colleague Henry Lickers often describes as naturalized knowledge systems. Um, it's not a one set of body of knowledge that someone can go and access at any one given time. It's it's a continuum and it includes all kinds of uh, uh, ethics and morality and, and uh, beliefs about our creation, you know, how we came to be um, as well as language itself. There's some progress on this. New York State, we're bringing back the Atlantic salmon by getting rid of dams in Maine and other parts of the East Coast and uh, the eels will come with the the salmon. So there's a, there is a process that, that may be restoring some of these resources. Chris, can we have another question? Whoever Chris is. GMO biomedicals. Would people in your community accept biomedical products from genetically engineered organisms? I suppose you mean things like insulin, right? Insulin. Sure. Um, good question. I, I Again, I, I think the answer, um, just like any other human being, there are people in favor of these advancements in technology and, and there are people who are, who are dead set against it. Um, and it, it's a great question because for indigenous people, we are facing these large scale epidemics, especially of diabetes um, that probably result in changes, um, you know, long term changes to our diet. Um, and so at some point, biomedical um, you know, uh, solutions um, that come from the wild, per se, um, you know, are probably going to be inevitable. Um, in fact, I think uh, as society starts to think about closed loop production, even in the biomedical field itself, we have to look to nature. Uh, we have to look to the healing power of plants, um, which is one of those relationships we've had. Uh, and so who knows, maybe Chestnuts were actually medicine more than food, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a, a much sort of large scale, you know, view from space, if you will, um, on, on plant culture. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, can we have another question? Natural GMOs. I'm curious how will people in your community take the news that there are GMOs made in nature, no human intervention, the sweet potato. Have you read much about this, Neil? Or do you know about this case? I don't know much about it. It's just that the um, all of the sweet potatoes that are commercially grown, so you go to a grocery store and it says organic sweet potatoes, uh, they contain transgenic material because the agrobacterium will move genes across species naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there are mutations continually. So. Many of the natural foods that we eat uh, have themselves, but well, maize, for example. Um, so, uh, how how do these personal relationships work out between traditional ecological knowledge folks who really really believe that plants are given a mission, and people who think a plant is a collection of recipes made by DNA that tell it what to do, and if you change the DNA, it will do something else. And I'm just curious: are there conversations going on? Is that a, a difficult point to get past, or how does that work out? I, well, for one, the conversations are very new. Um, uh -huh. and, and so this is why it's important to consult with indigenous people at the very start, at the very beginning. Um, because if that doesn't take place, there's always this sort of suspicion uh, that follows uh, consultation. And, and oftentimes, consultation simply means checking a box. For the, for the law or the policy that's in place. Um, and in fact, um, scientists in general, um, you know, working for regulators in particular, only started to really consult with indigenous people, you know, in the last 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, the EPA was the first uh, federal agency to develop a, an Indian policy on how they are gonna consult with indigenous people. And that was 1984. I see. Uh, and, I see. and so, 
it, it really depends on you know the playing field as well uh, and recognizing that oftentimes indigenous people and, and nations themselves don't have the adequate resources to address these questions. Uh, they don't have a litany of lawyers and, and technologists and scientists at their bevy. Um, and so we have to do the best we can to, 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 to come up with our own assessment um, and, and to think about these terms in a, in a larger uh, context. I'm curious, are, are we, we're okay? Okay, um, Chris has disappeared from our screen. Um, so I, I'm curious then, uh, the notion of communities with bounded knowledge that hold them together. This is a very important concept. At the same time, um, at least in my work in India, I find that, that it's difficult to know who speaks for a community. Uh, and in every community, there are people who want to rush ahead, people who want to, to mm -hmm. rely more on tradition, uh, and people who interpret tradition differently. Is this a big issue, the unity, both cognitively and politically, socially, uh, in your community, so that you can speak as, as one community to the regulators, to the scientists, to the larger community around the Onondaga Nation? Yeah, great question. It's, it, I will say that um, over time, one of the, the challenges we've had is carving out the time to allow for that consensus to build. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which we do it in our traditional communities is through our clans. Uh, and so we always talk about the fact that if I can't convince my sister, uh, because we're a matrilineal society, so mm -hmm. I can't convince my mom or my grandmother or my auntie um, of, of you know, what to view about genetically modified organisms or, or transgenic chestnuts, then we don't really have any business trying to convince another clan of that position. We have to come, as they say in our culture, of one mind. Uh, we call it una jekwa and that and that really says, you know, we have now come to one mind, and that takes lots of time. It takes lots of information. It takes acknowledgement that things are changing at a much more rapid pace uh, over the last century. And uh, that is time we are not afforded by these regulators or uh, people who want to know the answer tomorrow because time is money or something like that. You know? mm -hmm. So that, that's part of the difficulty, I would say. Um, but we have to hold true to that process. That's part of that precautionary principle of do no harm. And you need unanimity. We need consensus. consensus. Um, yes. Yep. Okay. Now I, we haven't talked at all about global warming because of all the challenges that face um, traditional ecological knowledge as well as the use of natural environments. There's nothing quite like global warming. We've never had anthropogenic changes like this on the scale before. Mm -hmm. um, is this is this a big issue among the people in your community? And is there a set of responses that people think might be more appropriate as opposed to responses that might be less appropriate? So curious thing, if you think about the history of, of indigenous people on, on Turtle Island in North America, in fact, we have seen anthropogenic um, changes in our climates and that's due yeah. to removal that's due to a very sad and tragic uh, part of our history where we were forced onto reservations many times clear across the country in some kind of environment that the culture was not used to at all and still may not be getting used to at all the, the state of oklahoma contains you know yeah. a huge portion of, a diaspora of, of in, indigenous nations who relocated there from you know the Great Lakes and, and from the Rocky Mountains, place from from the Everglades of, of the Panhandle. So it's um, so one of the opportunities we have is to use those strategies for survival as we move forward under climate change, and think about what gifts and responsibilities Indigenous people have that could potentially be part of the solution um, and the resilience of indigenous people, the fact that we are still here and that you'll hear that across Indian country today is, you know, we are still here um, is significant. Uh, and many of our elders still talk about how amazing it is that indigenous yes. people have survived. Yes. Um, and that's really what we are entering into, right? It's this mode of survival um, with this climate change. So we have another question I'm told. Chris, maybe you can read it better than I can, Neil. <laughs> sure. Chris, we have our question? Uh, at what point in the research process should you incorporate or address DEK, 
while developing the research question or in data collection? Good question. Um, this is something that I cover in my seminar on TEK. And the curious thing about TEK is that it's not something that can be found uh, as you might find information in, in Western science. And so I always advise students and researchers to, um, before you think about incorporating TEK or addressing it, really um, start to get to know the community itself and to consider co-locating and spending a lot of time with indigenous people because otherwise you're going to get some really skewed TEK. Um, you know, we've seen that with anthropologists in the last hundred years who show up in our community and say, you know, I, I want this answered, you know, and, and these are my questions. And it's really sort of a, a type of vampire research. They're there and then they flee, you know, the work of the center. Uh, and so yeah. this is fairly, only fairly recent, you know, and when you think about science in general, it, it's probably only 20 or 30 years that scientists have sort of woken up and said, gee, maybe we should be paying attention to this. Um, yeah. And so that's um, that's a little bit different. Uh, but one thing that's for sure uh, that we find in the community of, of ESF is building alliances um, and really thinking about how their work can benefit communities and showing support for uh, indig indigenous issues um, and the environment. Um, so yeah, at the very least, we have plenty of scientists building alliances with indigenous communities. Uh, and recognizing the sensitivity of TEK as well, thinking about protocols for, for engaging with indigenous people and in communities and governments. The, the point you make about the relative recent developments that, that um, would, can't make any clear conclusions about either the trajectory or what's been accomplished or where it might go. Um, we were just about to the end of this. I wanted to push you a little bit on the chestnut since okay. we started on the chestnut. So we have people that look for mutations, we have people that do sexual crossing, we have people who do mutagenesis. Do you yourself think of any of these as being more or less acceptable if you could restore the chestnut forest um, that were so important historically to your people and to, to everyone who lived on the East Coast of the United States? Well, personally, I, I'm not in, in favor of, of, of transgenic chestnuts, uh, purely from, from, a, from a moral standpoint. Um, and I often think the same reason that our teachings talk about plants arrive for a reason might not be that different for plants leaving us for a reason. I um, see. It's, it's, it's again that reciprocity. We have to we have to take the precautionary principle, do no harm, and we have to uh, say there there are changes in the landscape, and and it's indigenous people. We our our responsibility is is to give back, and and to think about other ways in which we could give back, and maybe spend our time and energy in, in other methods of gratitude that maybe aren't so hasty. I think this is a very valuable perspective for our learners and for our team because nothing like this has quite come up yet and I think it's a very important thing to consider. So with this, I think we will close down our session. Thank you for joining us and um, continue to enjoy the MOOC. Oh, uh, I'm also to I'm told to tell people to continue to post on Facebook. When you put things on Facebook, we see it. So this is one of our traditional knowledge systems. It's, it's intruded on us and we've adapted to it. <laughs> Thank you.